Welcome to Project Foodie. My name is Daniel Holzman. I'm the chef and owner of the Meatball Shop restaurants in New York City. And you are here in my home kitchen in Brooklyn, New York, where we are about to cook vegan lentil soup. This recipe has three simple steps. It should take somewhere around 45 minutes. So when we test the recipes for Project Foodie, we wanna make sure they're perfect. So throughout the week before cooking, I cook everything for dinner. I made the lentil soup a pound worth of lentils seemed reasonable to me, but it turned into a cauldron worth of soup. I'm talking a gallon of soup and wasn't really sure what I was supposed to do with all of this soup, except it was so delicious that I ate every single bit of it. Literally lunch and dinner for five days straight, all I ate was lentil soup. It was amazing. First and foremost, I wanna gather all of our ingredients and have everything sensibly laid out. In a restaurant, we call this mise en place. It means having everything ready at a hand's reach for when you need it. We want to get our lentils on to cook. And First and foremost, we want to get our lentils on to cook. They are going to take the longest. So if you've watched any episodes before, you know that I don't often measure many ingredients. I do it by eye. In this case, lentils tend to soak up a lot of liquid and they expand. So I'm going to measure these and follow the recipe fairly exactly. Whenever I work with beans or lentils, I like to make sure that there are no stones in them. Um, and so we're gonna rinse them because they can be a little bit dusty, but we're also just gonna pour them. So you notice I was kind of watching while I poured them into the measuring cup. I'm gonna watch them as I pour them into the strainer and just make sure that they're actually all lentils and no stones. I find that Goya brand is really Reliable, there are very infrequently any stones in there. Um, maybe almost never. Some of the other brands of lentils, you actually do find stones and you might want to sort them a little bit more carefully. There's nothing worse than biting into a stone and breaking your tooth in the middle of dinner. So these are really easy. I'm literally just rinsing them and I've got our strainer here. We can leave our bowl over here for later. And then we're gonna put our lentils we're gonna dump some lentils in the sink. We're gonna put our lentils into our cooking pot and we're gonna cover them with the water. And you know, you don't have to be absolutely perfect about this, but again, if you don't put enough water, the lentils will absorb all of it and there won't be any room left. Throughout this process, depending upon the type of lentil you use or how dry they are or you know vegetables are fickle and different you might need to add a little bit more water when I made it the first time I had to add some more water so just over a medium high flame we're gonna get those lentils going from the time the lentils start cooking it should take about 30 or 35 minutes so we want to get that going as quickly as possible and now our lentils are going we're going to prep our veggies so the second longest thing that we need to cook here is a potato now First thing I'm gonna do is scrub it because the potatoes often have a little bit of sand in those nooks and crannies and we don't want sandy soup. I happen to have a potato scrubber, handy, because I always do sitting over my sink, but the reality is that you can just kind of use your hands or, or, a, um, or a sponge. But if you happen to have a professional Japanese potato scrubber, like I do, you're welcome to use that. So we've got our potato, which has scrubbed any sand out of the eyes or the nooks, and we're gonna dice these guys. Now, the thing is that the lentils take longer than the potatoes to cook. However, um, I like the potatoes to be really soft and falling apart. They help, they help to thicken the soup, but they also kind of like, I don't know, they, they really, they, they leach out their flavor in an interesting way. So the potatoes, I wanna get them in early so they cut. We're just going to dice these potatoes. So basically I cut off the ends to give myself a flat section to work with so I'm not working with a round vegetable that's kind of sloppy and all over the place. Slice it into a few slices and then again, just dice down. I'm not overly um, careful about making them perfectly the same size because ultimately they're all gonna fall apart and turn into mush because we're making a lentil kind of like soupy stew. But 
I do cut them into pieces. <laughs> How'd I do? All right, these guys are gonna go right in with the lentils and come up at the same time, so we can just dump these right in. And that is really the only time sensitive, so you notice I was like in a little bit of a hurry there. That's the time sensitive situation, is that getting the lentils and the potatoes cooking, because they take a long time to cook, as early as possible. Now I can kind of slow down, give them a stir, and I'm gonna wait for these to just come up to a boil over that kind of high heat, at which point we're gonna lower them down. The other vegetables we're gonna prep here are gonna be our onion, which we're going to dice. So we're gonna take the kind of, there's a bolster end and a stem end. We're just gonna barely trim off the bolster end, leaving the bolster that holds the onion together intact. We're gonna slice a little bit more out of the kind of stem end, exposing the flesh. Putting it flesh side down, we're gonna cut our onion directly in half, and then we're gonna peel out any of the outer leaves and remember that this is a great example. You see this? It kind of looks like it's been peeled because it's not yellow, but if you were to really carefully look at that, you could see that this is a developing skin. It's drying out that second layer and that will never ever cook and it'll be really tough. So I want to make sure that any of that tough skin comes off of our onion um, before we start to make that soup. It looks to me like this onion has a little bit of frostbite here. So I'm going to get rid of that layer. There's a little bit extra. I don't throw out a whole onion because there's a little bruise. We just take our knife and we can just kind of trim it off. So don't fret if your onions aren't perfect. Neither are you. Here's the deal. So to dice our onion, we're literally just going to cut straight through. Notice my knife does not reach all the way to the end here so that even though I cut through the whole onion to the bottom, the onion stays together because the bolster is holding it in place. So we cut through at the desired dice size. I always count one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. That way I know I'm making them the same size. If I get to nine cuts, it means you cut too thin. Once, hara horizontally. Is there a word for that? And then we're gonna go straight down just to give ourselves dice. Again, we're making soup. I don't have to be overly careful about making it absolutely perfect. These onions, however, are going to get cooked until kind of almost burnt. And so if I do have any like little tiny pieces, they might get burnt. The nice part about this soup is that the kind of extra caramelized burnt flavor of the sugar in the onions is gonna actually add a really interesting nuance, so I'm not worried. There is this little core, which you can kind of see here, which holds the whole onion together we're gonna discard those two pieces. And we can put our onions to the side. To prepare our garlic, we're literally just gonna take a couple of cloves. We're going to use the side of our knife and carefully so that we don't cut ourselves, we're just gonna give it a little pound. And that will have two effects. One, it's gonna loosen the skin, making it super easy to peel. Peeling garlic does not have to be a chore if you happen to have all the tips and tricks from the Project Foodie app, or you just pound on them. Um, and then the other thing it does is that it kind of starts the chopping process. You can see it's broken up, so I'll just trim off the very end and then give the actual garlic cloves a little chop into smaller pieces, maybe once over again. We can separate those to the side. Woof! We are tearing it up here at Project Foodie. Off to the races, making lentil soup. Ladies and gentlemen, start your engines, check your lentils, give it a stir, and then let's peel the Swiss chard. So, here's the deal with Swiss chard. The stem, it really actually funny. We prize the leaves in Swiss chard. And I was reading this old French cookbook because I think the flavor of the stems is really interesting. It's got this like interesting metallic delicious flavor that you don't really get anywhere else. And um, I was reading this old French cookbook and it was talking about how normally you discard the leaves and use the stems. And I was like, that's so crazy. Is that a mis misprint? And the answer is no. Apparently now we throw away the stems and use the leaves. And back in the day, you used to throw away the leaves and use the stems. Just goes to show you that like, both the stems and leaves are good. <laughs> um, 
whatever your perspective. <laughs> um, the way I'm going to peel the Swiss chard is I'm going to take two fingers and I'm going to pinch the leaves without pinching the stem. And then I'm just literally going to peel down. And you can see that the stem pulls out and the leaf pulls out. Really, really easy. And you wind up with a stemless leaf and a leafless stem. So, again, so I'm going to just literally take the stem in, in my left hand, if I'm a righty, I'm going to pinch the leaf and the stem together between my left, my right hand, my, my thumb and my forefinger. You knew that we were born with opposable thumbs and that makes us different than apes? No, that makes apes different than other primates. That makes us primates. And I'm just going to peel the stem and the leaf away so that I get a leaf with no stem and I get a stem with a tiny bit of leaf which I'm going to pluck off. So we definitely want to do that because the leaves and the stems are going to cook for different amounts of time. So by separating them, again, if I get a little leaf and a little stem mixed up, it's okay. You know, we're just making soup here. Um, I'm sure the Lebanese grandmas aren't like painstakingly separating. They're just like doing what I do normally, separating. Um, so I can separate these guys. I'm noticing that this stem, it's a little kind of, this one's a little wonky. It's kind of a little, it's a little wonky. It's a little rotten. Normally I'd say like, oh, I can trim most of those parts out, but the whole thing is not so nice. So maybe we'll just discard this one. There's no reason to use that particular stem. Um, and then for these leaves that I've made this nice pile out of, we can just kind of stack them and we can cut them into bite-sized pieces so that no one's like eating their soup and is making spaghetti leaves out of giant pieces of, of Swiss chard. You know what I'm saying? Cut it once. Give it a turn and we're just going to dice it into bite-sized pieces. Our stems, however, they're going to take a long time to cook um, and they're really tough. So we're going to cut them a lot smaller. Um, what we're going to do is we're actually just going to start kind of at the thin end and we're going to slice them. Fairly thinly into little pieces. Um, a big piece of stem can be quite fibrous and you can imagine that the fibers are running in this direction. So by slicing it thinly across the grain, we're making them way more tender. So just slice them into kind of thin slices. And when this soup is going to be done, these are going to really melt and fall apart. Um, so you're really not going to be able to distinguish between onions or Swiss chard. So again, I'm not being overly careful about making it perfect. I'm just cutting it kind of, you know, simply at the right size. So there's a subtle difference between the green and the yellow. And generally speaking, like in carrots, you know, we see a lot of orange carrots versus some of the red carrots, which we don't see as often. Generally speaking, the ones we see the most of are either A, the most delicious, or B, the most shelf stable, travel stable. So they've been developed as the, the varietal of that vegetable that has been brought to market because it has a quality that works for commercialization. In the case of Swiss chard, I find that the yellow one has a little bit more of a metallic flavor. The green one is a little bit more sweet and the red is somewhere in between, but they're pretty much interchangeable. When I'm just choosing one, I usually choose green chard. It's usually a little less expensive and for me, it's the sweetest. Also, after you cook it, they kind of all look the same. So we've got our lentils cooking. They've just come up to a boil. We have our veggies prepped and ready to go. And that is the end of step one. So step two, we're going to start cooking our vegetables. So here's the deal with this lentil soup. It's really simple. There are very few ingredients. We've got sweetness from the onions and the chard. You've got the savory lentils, and then you've got the lemon, which is gonna bring a lot of lightness and acidity. It balances out really, really well. The spices are gonna give it like that distinct Middle Eastern flavor that I love so much. And what we're gonna learn how to do right now is how to dry toast spices. So I start with a, with a pan, no oil or anything, and we're gonna put our spices in there. So we've got some cumin seed, and we have some coriander seed that have been ground. I freshly ground these right before we started. Very, very easy to do. Basically, we're just gonna heat up the pan with the spices in there while we gently shake it around over a medium high heat. What we don't wanna do is burn the spices. So I'm just gonna kind of carefully watch them and as the pan heats up, 
these spices are gonna toast and they're gonna release their flavors. There's actually oil in there. There's a lot of oil that are in those dried spices and that's gonna start to kind of fry the spices from the inside. So dry toasting spices is a, is a really great way to release flavors. Like when I make chili, it has this really delicious, like fragrant, spicy flavor that doesn't happen if you don't toast the spices first. It's just like an essential step. So we've got these spices and I'm kind of, as our pan heats up, I can really start to smell it immediately. And if you're doing, the, you notice I didn't put anything hot, nothing spicy in here. If you're dry toasting chilies, I mean, you gotta keep the windows open. You will be burning out the house, like coughing and sputtering from rooms over. Your neighbors are calling the, calling the doctor, uh, ambulance, calling the hospital, calling the fire department, calling the cops, calling the landlord. Um, so I I'm, I'm usually do not like to put anything spicy in at that point. I can notice the color change subtly. If you notice that it's brown, it's done. If you notice that it's black, you're done. Do not burn the spices and then continue. Stop, throw it out, and start again. If you burn your spices, that flavor is going to stay forever and it's gonna ruin your soup. So we're gonna, just gonna toast these until they kind of come to that dark brown and I can smell them. At which point we're gonna add our oil. And the oil is an ingredient. I put a lot of oil in there and we're gonna add our onions. Now, the cool oil and the cool onions are gonna cool down the hot pan and they're gonna arrest no, the spices are not going to jail, people. Arrest is another word for stop. They're gonna stop the spices from continuing to toast and burn. So we're just gonna give those a little toss or stir with our spoon. And we're gonna cook these onions. Now, I want all my onions. Now, when we cook onions and we want to caramelize them, when we talk about caramelized, we're talking about caramelizing. We're literally taking the sugar in the onions and we're turning it into caramel. We are burning it subtly. We, if we want to caramelize our onions, we never add salt because salt is a diuretic. No, it's not gonna make you skinny. It literally means it draws the moisture out of something. So we basically add salt to our onions, it draws the moisture out and the onions sweat or cook slowly, stew in their own juices. If you don't add any salt, the onions retain their moisture and they brown more easily. So if I want to saute and get color on my onions, I'm going to cook them with no salt, just like this, over a high flame, bring the flame up to high, and we're going to literally cook these until they, until they start to like border on burnt. So this is probably a 10 minute process just cooking these onions. Mm, the reality is that there's not much to do right now, but you got time to lean, you got time to clean people. Use that elbow grease, put it to work. We're gonna clean up a little bit because we got a couple minutes while our onions are cooking. And you know what they say about a watch pot? It's already boiling.
And I want to like, I do want to periodically stir our onions because that looks really great though, huh? You know what, I've actually, I've been to the Middle East, I've been to Egypt, um, I've been to the United Arab Emirates, to, I've been to Kuwait, um, and I've been to um, Dubai, but I've never been to Lebanon. Um, Lebanon and Syria where, you know, they're really like famed for having some of the best food in the world. And I'm a little bit sad about that. I actually developed this recipe from one of my favorite um, uh, 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 cookbooks, Arabesque which is one of Claudia Rodin's cookbooks. She's like one of the best cookbook authors out there and all of her cookbooks are amazing and this recipe is really, really delicious. So if your onions are like freaking out on you and, and they're already starting to burn, um, you can add the rest of your vegetables or you can lower your flame um, at this point or you can add a little bit of water. Mine need a little bit longer here. Um, I've got a kind of heavy bottom saute pan. Ultimately though, um, the next step is we're going to add our Swiss chard stems and we're going to add our garlic and cook it for another minute. So um, bear with me. I really, I really want these to, I mean you can start to see that they're starting to caramelize a little bit like the edges but we really want to give them time and and this is one of the main factors so this soup is going to cook for another 15 to 20 minutes however we don't have a lot to do and we're always in a rush to get everything in the soup pot and get done because that feels like we've accomplished something but the reality is that building the flavor by cooking the onions slowly in the oil, allowing them to burn slightly, stirring them is a really essential part to making this soup absolutely delicious. Again, really, really simple. Make sure you have great ingredients and then treat them carefully. That's exactly what I'm looking for. You start to see that at some point, the water in the onions is kind of cooked out. There's really starting to caramelize perfectly. The spices are trying to crisp up, little tiny burnt pieces in here. And right about now, let me give them another one minute. Another one minute. The lentils a little stir. You can taste our lentils and you'll see that some of them are starting to fall apart, but some of these pieces are still completely whole. Raw lentils, give you gas. You want to cook your lentils completely. Legumes in general, cooked all the way through, unless you want to be talking out of the wrong hole. Listen, no one likes a shit talker, people. Get it? All right. So, you can see our onions. This is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about really beautifully caramelized. When I, I start to see each and every single piece dehydrated, little bit tiny bit burnt on the outside, little few black pieces. And that's when my onions are where I want them to be. And that's the flavor that's going to really give a distinct sweetness to the soup. So at this point, we can add our salt. We can add our garlic. And we want to toast our garlic for about one minute. Garlic never really cooks properly in liquid, so you do want to dry cook it in this oil. But burnt garlic has a really kind of negative flavor, really nasty, distinct flavor. So we do want to toast our garlic in with the oil and the onions. And then right as it starts to brown, and it's a hot pan, so it's about one minute when our garlic is going to start to be brown, we're going to add our Swiss chard stems. They're big enough and they have enough moisture, there's enough of them, they're cold enough and they have enough moisture that they're going to cool down the pan and slow down the cooking process. So, the garlic has been in for about a minute. I can smell the toasting garlic in the air. We're going to add our Swiss chard in to our pan. <laughs> eh. 
And you can hear it start to sputter because there's a lot of, again, water or moisture in that Swiss chard, which is cooling it down. And it's almost burnt. It's right on the verge here that we can just turn off our flame and we're going to put all these vegetables in to our lentil soup. So I'm going to take these guys and move our lentil soup front and forward. Again, lowering it down to kind of a medium, low flame. We can just stir our veggies and drop them right in. Now, these vegetables and the lentils are gonna cook for about 15 minutes together. If you notice, you got some spices left over here and you're like, well, I wanna make sure that I get all that frond, all the caramelized sugars out of there. No problem, I can dump some of the water from our soup right into the pan, give it a little, a little mix around, and then that's gonna get dumped right back in. So now we've got our lentils, our potatoes, our garlic, our spices, our onions, and our Swiss chard stems in our pot. This is the time that we wanna take a look at it. And we wanna decide, do I need to add a little bit more water? And if it's a little bit thick like this guy here, where really the lentils are at the very top and they're bubbling over, I really do need kind of an inch of water because I'm gonna add all that Swiss chard and it's gonna to continue to cook. So for me at this point, I'm gonna add another cup and a half of water. If yours is, is a little bit more liquidy, I can really see it's quite thick and dry in here. If yours is, is, is a little soupier, you're not gonna to need to add any more water. If it looks like that, add a little bit more water. So, we have our lentil soup with all the vegetables in there cooking, and that is the end of step two. Step three, we're going to add our Swiss chard and lemon into the soup. We're going to pick our herbs, slice our radishes, and make our garnish. Then we're gonna plate, garnish, and serve. So, our soup has just been cooking with all of our vegetables for a minute or two. Again, those Swiss chard stems really only had a couple of minutes of head start, but that will be enough. We want the leaves to really be falling apart, but we don't want them to be completely disintegrated in mush. At this point, we can add those guys into our soup. Give them a little stir in there. We're gonna add our lemon juice. So I've got this nifty lemon squeezer. Here's the deal. Because this is a lime reamer or a lime squeezer, not a lemon squeezer, it's a little bit too small to fit a lemon in, which is bigger than a lime. So I'm just gonna cut it into quarters. There are lemon squeezers that look exactly the same. They came out on the market fairly recently. The reality is that I don't wanna have two different tools, so I'm just gonna cut this lemon into four pieces. And I'm gonna put quarters in. The interesting thing about the way to use a lime or a lemon squeezer is you put the lemon in upside down. It's counterintuitive. It looks like it should fit in like that. But the truth is you want to put it in upside down. That's going to squeeze the juice through the holes. It's going to turn it inside out, which actually like breaks the oils out of the skin and you get this really strong flavor out of it. So it's actually even better. So I'm going to just squeeze our lemon juice right in and you can see actually you wind up with so much juice out of a lemon when you use one of these squeezers. And I squeeze it completely together and then I'm just going to Toss those guys. Mm. And this lemon juice is a really important component. Um, for a soup like this, I would probably have a second lemon sitting around because, uh, because you might want to add a little bit more lemon um, at the end because it's really, the acidity helps to bring out the sweetness of the onions and the lentils. So I've squeezed about three quarters of my lemon in there. I'm gonna reserve one quarter to just brighten it up at the very end. Can give our soup a stir. And this is now gonna cook for another 12 or so minutes. 
at which point the potatoes, all the vegetables are going to be completely stewed down. And then we're going to taste it. We're going to re-season it. We're going to add a little bit more salt and decide, you know, where, where we're at. Um, we can add the turmeric at this point. I add the turmeric a little bit later on. It's got, I don't know, a little bit more of a subtle flavor that tends to kind of dissipate. So maybe don't, don't need to cook it for quite as long with the turmeric. The turmeric is going to stain everything a beautiful kind of yellow and bring a gorgeous hue to our otherwise deliciously brunette soup. So our soup is just stewing now over a medium flame. I don't know if you have one of these things. If you don't have a little spoon rest on your stove, there's nothing that drives me more crazy than when someone's stirring with a spoon and then sticks their spoon right on their stove. It's very, very dirty. It bakes on. It's hard to clean. Everybody should have a spoon rest. I happen to get mine in a fancy place. I'm not going to tell you where because they're not for sale. So while our soup is stewing, we're going to prepare the salad for our garnish. And in the fridge, I have some cilantro, some green onions, and some radishes. These look like they were fresh from the gardens at Chernobyl because these are the biggest radishes I've ever seen in my entire life. The greens of radishes are actually really, really delicious. And if you wash them well, they're a great addition to the soup. These ones are a little bruised and battered and I don't know, they, they just, they smell like they, they're, they're starting to turn. So I'm just going to actually tear these off and toss them. And then I'm going to give our radishes a rinse. Radishes grow underground. They're a root. And so they, they're often quite sandy. So I'm going to give these a rinse. Um, literally just submerge them completely in cold water and really agitate them. If you're going to serve the stems, in this case I'm not, but if you're going to serve the stems right around the stem here, there's a lot of sand in them. And so I want to be extra careful there. In this case, I'm going to cut that part off. I just want to make sure that I've definitely rinsed all the sand off of my radishes. And basically we're just going to dry these guys, dry our bowl. And then we're going to take a few sprigs of cilantro and we're going to drop them in. removing the stems. Now, cilantro stems are actually really tender and delicious. And whenever I cook with cilantro, I, I use the stems. In this particular case, you know, we're making this salad really as a garnish. It's going to look, live over the top. Um, you don't need to make this salad. The soup is delicious on its own. Um, I do this because I think it adds a little bit of character, uh, 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 it, it adds a little bit of color. It looks beautiful and it adds some acidity and some just kind of like extra flavor to the otherwise fairly monotone soup. This soup, even though it's really well balanced, you know, it's, it's pretty traditional peasant food. It doesn't have like a lot of different, um, uh, of, of flavor going on. And this salad over the top just gives it a little bit of freshness and crunch. So we can drop those guys in, um, for our scallions. I'm just going to take a couple of them, peel off any of the kind of outside leaves that are a little bit wilted, trim just the very stem end. The chef, when I used to work in fancy restaurants, would check the garbage. And if there was more than like a millimeter of stem missing from the scallions, you were in trouble, people. So you can peel off any of that kind of stuff. Mm. Take our scallions. Get rid of our waste here. And then I'm going to take these guys and we're just going to cut them as thinly as possible. So one trick to make this go a little faster for me is I cut them in half and then I line them back up because now I've got half the length. Moving my knife to a bias like that, I'm just going to cut these guys again as thinly as I can. to make a nice kind of crunchy raw onion that's going to add the top. If we love all that raw onion flavor, 
but it's a little bit too sharp for us. Scallions are a great alternative. They're a little less sharp, they're in the onion family. They have all the flavor and sweetness, but kind of not quite as, as strong as just a raw onion. I happen to love raw onions. For a lot of people, it gives them heartburn or it could be a little bit off-putting. So we've got our scallions. Put those guys right in our bowl. And then we've got these radishes. So these guys are really big. Normally I would just kind of slice them thinly. If you happen to have a Japanese mandolin, that's a great tool. If I do rounds of this big, they'll be a little bit big. So maybe we'll just kind of cut, trim the end off. Whenever I'm working with something round that tends to fall, I'll just give a little slice to give it a flat landing pad. Maybe just two radishes are gonna do. These guys are mongoloid. Um, and then we're just gonna slice them into, maybe matchsticks will be nice, so maybe um, quarter inch slices. Now, if you're wondering how you can cut so that it stays together like that, rather than like this, when I cut and the radish, when, when I cut sometimes and the radish doesn't stay together in a nice pile, that's because you notice I cut straight down in this case, I pull the knife through. And when I pull the knife through, it stays stuck to the pile because by the time it's already cut, it's sticking on this side before the knife goes through. And that's great if I want to then maybe take this perfect pile of potato chips, radish stacks, poker chips, make them money. Stack and radishes, cheddar stackers, anonymous, y'all. Hip hop, making that lentil soup, Lebanon, what, what? We can cut them this guy. Now, oh my God, I'm choking on a radish. That's what I get from making fun of uh, whoever I made fun of. Um, if you notice while you're stirring your soup that it's sticking, you wanna give it a good stir. Release any lentils from the bottom. If it's really kind of like starting to stick there, do not scrape it all up, transfer it to a new pot because you don't want to scrape the burnt bottom into the soup incorporating it. You can save it. Um, in this case, it was a tiny bit starting to stick, but you know, I could feel that it just scraped right off. It wasn't really burnt. We can take these guys here and literally just go down and cut them into matchsticks the same kind of size as we had made the first slices. Um, so basically I'm just slicing slowly into matchsticks. Those guys can go right in our bowl and that's gonna be a really beautiful salad garnish which we can season right before we're ready to go. I wanna make sure this is really fresh and crispy so I'm going to keep it in the fridge. <laughs> um, we have some leftovers here. I want to keep these for another time, fresh and crispy. So I'm going to put these in the fridge also. Get it? We're going to hide them. Okay.
So our soup is completely finished. We've just given it an extra taste. Mm. Right before we plate it to make sure that we don't need to adjust the seasoning, we can pull our salad out of the fridge and we're gonna season this just with whatever left of the lemon. A pinch of spicy cayenne pepper. Maybe a pinch more cayenne here. Do not rub your eyes, people. We've all made that mistake. And if you have to use the restroom, wash thoroughly because it is spicy. Give ourselves a little taste. Mm, it's like spicy and refreshing. And it's just gonna cut through the unctuous, rich soup. Man, that cayenne is pa -pow spicy. Woo! God bless America. Cayenne. Hi, yow. Like cow, cow bunga. Um, we are gonna use our dual purpose measuring club style ladle. <laughs> and just get a nice big scoop of our soup. We can drop our ladle right into the bowl so that it doesn't splatter. And then give ourselves a really nice scoop of our soup right in the bottom of our bowl. And then our salad is just gonna sit right on top. And that is our vegan Lebanese lentil potato Swiss chard soup with an herb and radish salad. Be sure to like and subscribe, check us on Instagram, and download the Project Foodie app on the iOS app store. I hope you've enjoyed this Project Foodie cook along and I hope you'll join us for more. If you want to make this delicious vegan Lebanese lentil soup, you're in luck because that's what we're making and you're going to need the following ingredients. We have a light and neutral flavored olive oil. I always use a neutral flavored light olive oil when I'm cooking because the expensive stuff is wasted in the cooking process and often can be bitter and kind of off-putting flavor. We have a lemon. We're going to do a little salad over the top. We've got some green onions or scallions. We've got some radishes and some cilantro. Um, if you don't love cilantro, you can use uh, parsley or mint, another herb. These radishes come with these green tops, which are actually, unfortunately, a little bit wilted, so I'm gonna toss them. If you find radishes with vibrant green, nice tops, feel free to throw those into the stew. They actually stew and are absolutely delicious. Some Swiss chard. You can substitute any type of leafy green you'd like, or you can add multiple types of leafy greens. I happen to love the flavor of Swiss chard with this particular recipe. We have rainbow chard, which is a variety of different colors, but you can use just green chard or red chard or, or yellow chard. They're all interchangeable. We have a yellow Spanish onion, which is really sweet and it's gonna add some sweetness to this dish, so I do like to use a yellow onion. The red onion works very well as well. Some garlic. We have some lentils, and we have to be careful when we choose. There are many different types of lentils, and all of them will work. However, I prefer these larger, light green lentils. There are small, dark green lentils. They tend to be great for lentil salad. They don't break down when they're cooking, which makes them ideal um, if you want those whole kernels. They take a little longer to cook. For this soup, I want the lentils to break apart. It's gonna help to thicken it and bring it all together. It's gonna be really stewy and kind of like warming and delicious. So I like the less expensive, lighter green lentils. A Yukon gold or yellow wax potato. Um, traditionally, this soup is either made with potatoes or with rice. Either way works really well. I just happen to love the flavor of potatoes and lentils together. And then we have some freshly milled spices. I always keep all of my spices in whole form and I grind them fresh when I need them. It's really easy to do. I've got a little mechanical hand grinder. Um, for me, the spices, well for everybody, the spices just last longer and hold better when they're whole and then they release their kind of like nuanced, fragrant flavor when you grind them. So I've got some coriander seed, some cumin seed, some turmeric, and some cayenne pepper. Be careful with cayenne pepper, it's really, really spicy, so use it sparingly. If you guys want to make a very delicious, completely vegan Lebanese lentil soup with a beautiful herb and green onion salad, you will need the following tools. 
We have a medium bowl, a metal strainer, a pot that is appropriately sized for the amount of lentil soup you are going to make. Be advised, people, that lentils expand like hotcakes. I don't know if hotcakes really expand, but lentils definitely do. So you're going to need a way bigger pot than you think you're going to need. Um, if you undersized your pot and you're like cooking your lentils and they're starting to grow, that's fine. Transfer it into a bigger pot. No worries. We have a large saute pan where we're going to toast some spices and we're going to saute some onions. A knife and cutting board, a tasting spoon because this dish is very tasty and you're going to want to eat it throughout to see if your lentils are fully cooked. Measuring cups and measuring spoons, a wooden stirring utensil. I love this flat bottomed utensil that helps to stir and scrape the bottom of the pan to make sure nothing's sticking. And then I have a lemon reamer. This is Heco in Mexico, which means made in Mexico. Lime squeezer, actually, because um, that's what I happen to have. And it works really well for limes or lemons. I love it because it gets all the juice out of the lemons and it strains out the seeds simultaneously. The only problem is it's a little bit small, so you kind of got to cut the lemons extra. If you do not have a specialty lemon squeezing device, you can use your hand. God's lemon squeezer. Five finger discount. It's free, people. Squeeze away. You can use your left hand if you happen to have two of them to strain out the seeds.